Hello and welcome to another episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. Today I have for you a conversation that I had with Dr. Fujian Zain. Now, this was just one of those conversations where, you know, you lose track of time, which is really the sign of a great conversation. Before we knew it, an hour and a half had shown up and, uh, and I really wanted to talk more. And so I'm going to have to get her back on the show uh, multiple times to, to continue the conversation because I really enjoyed our time together. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Fujian and then we'll dive into the episode. So, Dr. Fujian Zain is a psychotherapist, a radio and podcast host, an international speaker and author. She has her doctorate in clinical psychology and is a licensed marriage and therap- sorry, marriage and family therapist practicing online and in her office in Southern California. Dr. Zane is the originator of Awareness Integration, Educational and Psychological Theory and Intervention, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Create the Life You Want. She has authored and co-authored five books, and she is the host of A Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian at KMET 1490AM ABC Radio. She appeared on the Dr. Phil show and as a guest speaker at universities, including Harvard. So I'm going to include links in the show notes to where you can go find Dr. Fujian all over the internet, uh, including to where you can buy her books. There are two book links in the, uh, in the show notes here. The first one is The Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Create the Life You Want. And the second book is Awareness Integration Therapy. So that is Dr. Fujian, and I can't wait for you to listen to this conversation. But before we dive in, I just have to say that this podcast is not possible without our amazing Patreon supporters. If you do have the means to do so, please head over to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew to get heaps of extra content over there, including access to a backlog now of about 70 to 80 Seneca series episodes, uh, including conversations that I haven't yet released with Sharon LaBelle uh, and the full conversations of the Masterclass series that we're doing with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Constantikos. So head over there for all of that stuff and extra. Uh, And for now, I just want to introduce you to our guest for the day, Dr. Fujian Zain. Dr. Fujian, thank you so much for coming on my show today. Uh, Just quickly, uh, before I dive in and ask you some questions, I just wanted to say that the reason we're here, for those who are listening, uh, is uh, Kai Whiting uh, said, uh, I've just spoken with Dr. Fujian, and uh, she's an amazing person. You have to have her on a show. Everybody who listens to my show knows that I take any recommendation from Kai very seriously because he's a great guy and I trust him. And so uh, I've been looking into your work and uh, I've been excited to talk to you. So welcome to the show. Uh, I guess, do you want to tell me and the audience just a little bit about who you are and what you do? Of course. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. And I truly think I had an amazing conversation with him on my show. And um, and then he definitely recommended you and um, wanted to, me to speak with you. And um, I'm excited about it. Um, I've been a psychotherapist for about 30 years. Uh, I started the whole process by working on myself. I came, um, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I am originally from Iran and I came when I was 12 years old. So practically I kind of raised myself here. And through the time, obviously there was a lot of going, you know, immigration has its own issues. And I had some traumas I've, I've, uh, as a child. So uh, by the age, let's say, um, 28th, it was uh, interesting that I had created everything that at that time I thought I wanted. Um, I had always said by age 30, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have my own business. I wanted to have my own house. Um, I did by age 28, I created all of that and I was not happy at all. I was miserable. I was actually very depressed. And I wanted to get a divorce. I wanted to let go of my business. And it was like, okay, okay, this doesn't make sense, right? I got everything I wanted and I'm miserable. So what's going on with me? And that started me going into two different routes. One was I went to psychotherapy and then on the side by side, I went to all these self-growth seminars in order to kind of like coaching and finding out who I was. So the journey kind of started from there. And then I decided I love how it's shifting me, changing me. And 
um, uh, finding about myself and how um, I can work. If I shift my thoughts, my behaviors, and it changes my world in a way, and then it also, I, I can have an impact on others. Um, that's why I went back to graduate school for psychotherapy. And then, um, you know, that's how it all started. And then through uh, the, the concept of psychotherapy, I went and studied with a lot of different people, all sorts of theories that were out there and kind of figured out um, what was working best as I combined some of these theories and interventions together. And then therefore I created kind of uh, my own model a theory of itself called awareness integration, which then we started doing practices and uh, a lot of research on it. Mm, mm. Yeah. Well, th thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, I'd love to dive into your uh, immigration to the United States and, you know, I don't know, you were 12 when you left. And so I don't know how much you remember of Iran, um, you know, before you, before you left, but what was that like for you as a kid coming from such a different culture what were some of the shocks for you? What did you like? What did you find uh, maybe didn't appeal to you so much about American culture? You know, what was it like for you? Um, it was interesting because I was very uh, rebellious as a child. And uh, my mom was a very famous um, um, pers radio personality. So anything that I would do as a rebellious child, you probably know in the media, it would get exasperated. So it was more like I either had to uh, be go toward whatever, you know, she or the culture said, or it would be a nuisance. It just wouldn't work. So it was more like, you know, uh, OK, I, we've got to kind of, you know, move ahead. And, um, and at that time in the 70s, uh, where you probably weren't even born uh, in the 70s, <laughs> it was in, you know, to go into boarding schools, either in Europe or United States. And that's what you did. So uh, they shipped me off to um, the United States. It was Scottsdale, Arizona. I went to Judson School. I think the shock was first that the first thing it was interesting that if I did not understand the language, the English language, although I had studied as a child, obviously, in school, but even if I didn't understand the accent or how it was, uh, people started talking louder to me as if if they talk louder to me, I would understand it. But it wasn't the volume. It was it was the speed. And half of the time I didn't know. And then I was interesting. I started learning English uh, through television. And, uh, you know, you put the closed caption. So it's written. It's writing there. And you could really listen and get the whole construct from it. Um, what it was interesting to me, actually, was I found uh, Americans to be very kind. They were very kind to me. Um, and wherever I went, um, when I needed somebody, they were there. I, remember I got out of high school when I was 15 and I went to ASU and um, Arizona State University. And when I came there, um, they had actually given up my dorm. So um, I was there and I went to a hotel at age 15 and everywhere is like, well, you're not 18 yet. We can't have you here. You don't have a guardian. Well, I'm alone. I don't have a guardian. So what are you going to do? I might, should I sleep on the you know, floor? And then I had this check going to the bank and they're like, well, you don't have a guardian. What are we going to do? So it was interesting at the time that the laws will not allow a 15 year old to do a lot of legal stuff, which is, you know, get an apartment, go into a hotel or, you know, do anything. When these people heard my story and I just said, this is what's going on. Everybody started helping. And it was funny, Simon, because I kept saying, oh, I can't trust people. I can't trust people. And then it dawned on me. The only way I survived was by trusting people and trusting. And they came through for me. And I remember in one apartment and I said, you know, I got to get an apartment because the dormitory was closed and I couldn't just sit in a hotel for a whole semester. And um, so this guy uh, who was the manager and his mother were the manager and they listened to my story again and they said, fine, we will, you know, uh, give you this uh, studio apartment. So they gave me that studio apartment. And then his mother came and bought um, when we went and purchased a lot of things for the apartment. And uh, they became kind of like my family for that time until the dorms opened and I went back. So my experience has been um, is almost like it, it um, opened up and uh, allowed me um, to grow 
here. Mm. Um, so that's what it was. And then the cons- the immigration itself and the acculturation of learning, um, obviously Ed, when you move somewhere first, there is a lo- loneliness. You miss home. And I was young, so I really missed home. Um, and it's and then you're trying to get involved with everything that is in front of you and um, and to take what's best from each one of the, your own culture and what you have from this new culture and then bringing it together and holding on to the best of what it was. Um, and I think that's what was for me. And when mm-hmm. I came became citizen, I think that was a very emotional for me. Um and uh, thank God, you know, at, at this point, I can have dual citizenship of both because it was very hard to think that I had to let go of one to get another one. Um, so I like this concept of the, you know, the dual citizenship and having the uh, having the opportunity to feel that I am an American Iranian or an Iranian American, and um, that I'm proud of both cultures in that way. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And and I'm I'm in my mind, I'm scrapping all these questions I had written down because I've got so many more that I've got to remember from you know your your, your previous statements here. So firstly, I, I want to dive into um perhaps uh you know, you had this experience of coming over and realizing how you could actually trust people and they wanted to help when when they saw somebody in need. And I feel like today uh it's it's pretty easy. And we see this a lot, people getting pretty cynical about the human race. You know, if all you see is the Facebook feed and the arguments that go on there or the Twitter feed and the arguments that happen there, we can build up this perception, this very cynical perception in our mind that uh, everybody is just at each other constantly. Um, But then I think, you know, you walk outside and you talk to people and it's pretty normal out there. A lot of the time when you actually go out and talk to people. Um, And I'm wondering what you think about, you know, how we can, uh, offer our trust to people more often uh, and to, to learn um, or even to, to give, give our care to people. How, how, what should we learn from this experience of, you know, when you're actually around people, talking to people, often you'll find that they are pretty helpful if, if you're genuine with them. Absolutely. I just want to share with you that I was here when um, uh, the hostage taking uh, was taking place in Iran after the revolution. I came out before the revolution of Iran. So after the revolution of Iran, there was hostage taking of Americans. So obviously, when I was in the U.S., there was a lot of hostility toward Iranians um, in Texas. And in, in at that time, I was going to Arizona State University, so in Arizona. Um, a lot of my friends were getting um, stabbed or paint was being thrown. There were a lot of like fights and stuff. And sometimes Iranians were uh, were afraid to say that I am an Iranian. And it was interesting because everywhere I went and people asked me, I said I was Iranian. I never changed that. But it was something that was different. And it was I wasn't hostile. And when somebody was hostile to me because of something that they heard, it would be more like connect with me. I'm a human being. You're a human being. Connect with me. Let me connect with you as who we are. We might have a different skin. We might have a different language, different background, different race. But there is a place that is human to human where you and I can connect. And I think that's the level of connection that we could really, really capture um, that I experienced. And throughout that time, I was never harmed. I never lied. I was who I was all the time. I was out there. Uh, But it was only that piece uh, of connection. Um, Fast forward, I had not experienced that until like uh, a year ago, where again, it just became very like the United States on its own became very politically charged. And we live in an environment that I think everybody around us in here or in in, in where we live is um, Republicans and I'm not. So it was interesting that we were going around the neighborhood and we're all friends and everything. And then suddenly one of the another lady from, you know, up a little bit further came in and I just went in and said hi because they were right beside our home with our neighbor. And I said, Hi, how are you? Are you also one of our neighbors? And she looks at me like, 
I heard you're an Iranian and you're a Democrat, are you? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> I can't stand you guys. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what have I done to you? Well, if you're a Democrat, that means you're a communist. I was like, oops, I didn't know of that. I mean, I'm not, so I don't have any idea what you're talking about. And uh, so she just went on and stuff. And then at one point, she just said, ah, I don't want to talk to you. She left. And I stood with my other um, neighbor, who's also a Republican, and I'm like, I'm sorry that she has that view of whether it's Iranians or, or Democrats. Um, and I wish, you know, that we could connect. Fast forward about three months later, she showed up again with her dog and she's talking about, you know, oh my God, I love your uh, lawn and I love this and I love that. And aren't you the doctor? And we started talking as if that conversation never happened. Mm. And I think a lot of it had to do with not getting reactive and not taking it personal. Like this wasn't personal to me. This was just something that she had an idea. This wasn't about me. And I wish that she would get another idea. And I'm hoping that by me not reacting that way, offensively or defensively, that she saw, yes, there could be an Iranian who's also a Democrat who's who's okay. Yeah. To hang out with. Yeah. I, lo I love that story. And I just, you know, I think <laughs> I, I laugh at it because it's, I, I kind of follow Seneca's advice. He says it's better to laugh at life than to bemoan it because it shows the the lighter side of the spirit, right? And and I love that we have people who have those kinds of views because I mean it's like if life is a play, then they add the flavor. It's like why, <laughs> you know, such such silly irrational views. But but your point is, you know, the thing that I really take out of this story, which I love, is that you did not respond with bitterness or by spitting venom in the situation, you just responded with your own sweetness, which, you know, of, of course does like, I think of, was it Abraham Lincoln? He said, you can catch more flies with a drop of honey than with a bucket of gruel. Right. And, and I think that this, this story really demonstrates one of the key issues that I think we're all facing today, which is this game of tit for tat. You know, we're, we're always looking to spit back at the people who spit upon us. You know, we're always looking to punch back when they punch us. And there's a real argument to be made that that literally does not lead anywhere. But, you know, violence, hatred, um, you know, furthering the situation that we do not want. And I'm wondering as a you know psychotherapist, and this might be our kind of gateway into that conversation, uh, how would you encourage people to start to develop that habit of taking on their own responsibility in the situation, even if they feel that they are being harmed or even if they feel like they are the ones who are, are, are being victimized in the situation? Yeah, I think that's something that uh, you also have a belief in and the Stoic uh, philosophy is that I can only control what I can control and I can't control other people. I can't control other people's thoughts, minds, uh, voices, what they what they comes out. But I can th I can do whatever it shows up. I can't even control my mind or my my uh, emotion as it shows up. But I can control what I'm going to focus on, and that is the difference. You know, my thoughts might just show up. I don't have control over this, or my emotions might show up because subconsciously I'm getting triggered with something. But I can, at that point, being aware of it, I can choose which thought process to join in and hang in there. Out of 10 thoughts that come, I can, I can hold on to one and let go of the other nine. Um, I can do things in order to shift my emotions or see what the message is. And then I certainly can choose my behavior. I certainly mm. can choose that. And the other part is I also go into what is my intention that I want to create? So yes, if somebody's coming to me because they're activated, however they're activated, um, and they're creating a, a, a relatedness with me, do I like that type of a relatedness? I can engage in it. Uh, or if I don't like that type of a relatedness, what type of a relatedness do I prefer and can I model that? You know, it's funny to go, somebody's angry at me, I also go be angry at them. And then, you know, um, kind of expect to have 
a humane relationship together and a loving relationship as a neighbor. Well, hello. If there is rage and rage, I don't see anywhere that a love could, you know, create. So intentionality of what is it that I want to create, I would suppose that I would tr take my behavior toward that. And I might not get an immediate response, which I didn't. And most of the people might not get an immediate response. But at least I didn't escalate it. You know, at least I yeah, didn't go yeah. to the next level. I did what I needed to do. And it's based on what I can actually control. So when I also work with clients, I keep looking at that piece that I can be a victim of the world always or I can shift that victimization stance. That doesn't mean we don't get victimized. You know, I was, I got sexually abused from the age three to eight uh, by different people. Was I a victim of the situation? Absolutely. I did not do anything as a child to deserve it, create it, promote it, none whatsoever. And I was a victim of that, but I didn't stay victimized. At age eight, when I had the ability and the power to say no, for the first time, I said no, because I figured I can now. And before that, I didn't even know I can. Um, then when I decided that I had this idea about all men are bad, I was like, well, it's kind of hard to go on a, into a relationship if you think all men are bad. <laughs> I had to change that. I had to figure it couldn't be all. Obviously, I saw a lot of people who weren't. And I could say, I don't want to make those people the type of a person with that type of a concept, but I would want to mate with another. So it's that piece of, would I stay victimized? And how is that serving me? Versus life happens many times. What part of it I create, what part of it it happens, and then how can I shift it into a space that, you know, um, I like it or I feel fulfilled with it, at least fulfilled with the way I think and feel and behave and, you know, the impacts I put. Um, and, and just, again, with what also the philosophy says, what can I control, what can I change, what can I influence, and what can I just accept and roll with it and learn from it? Yeah. Yeah, this is such such good advice. And what I love about your, um, I guess, your analysis of, of of the situation is you you tell both sides of the story. And I think that a lot of the time, we are, we latch onto one side of the story. You know, I was I was literally just having a conversation with one of my clients where we were talking about this about you know if you've if you've got anger in life, if you've got bitterness within you and you can see that you're responding in an ineffective way or in, in a way that's not really helping your own soul or the souls of those around you, uh, firstly, figure out why you're actually right to feel a certain way. <laughs> Understand your emotions are probably telling you that something's not quite right in the, in the world around you. And so give the devil his due, right? You might be victimized. There might be a situation that is, is going wrong that you need to fix. But at the same time, tell yourself the other side of the story, which is I have the ability to pause, to analyze the situation and to figure out how can I best respond to this so that I'm not, as I said earlier, spitting venom on the situation, but welcoming, like you're talking about, welcoming what might be good. What I'm, And I kind of see it as, you know, planting seeds and nourishing those seeds and some seeds fall on good soil and now they'll, they'll grow up and others don't. And that's okay. But all we can do is plant those seeds and nourish them. And so I just, I love, I love your outlook on this because it's so, uh, it tells these both sides of the story. And I guess, let me dive into a little bit later in your life when you come to uh, America and you have now set up your whole family situation, you know, you're married, you've got your house, you've got your business. What goes wrong that shows you I'm in the wrong place, you know, I, I need to figure out these issues because it, it's it's such a common story, right, that we get everything that we want and then realize it's definitely not what we really want. So what was it that tipped you off to that? And then what did you do about it? I, I was very unhappy because I hadn't uh, found, I kept saying I have found myself. Um, and I could say to you that what I had found within myself was a lot of shame and doubt and um, 
not knowing who I was and what I wanted. So it was more like I was born into somebody else's fame. So I wasn't seen and other person was always seen. And I was, you know, kind of like the byproduct of this person. And then my mom was a very, um, it was someone who was very, very uh, thought in a high level. So she expected me to be, um, you know, a, a particular place in, in careers. But that wasn't what I was looking at. And um, so it was always something that she wanted me to be and I couldn't be. So my identity was not set in a sense. I didn't have an option to set my own identity in a sense. And then when I came in, which is the age of identity, it was survival. It wasn't, you know, you're not in a, in a cushiony place where family's there, they're giving you everything. And then therefore you are allowed to find your own identity as a teenager, which is the best time to do that. I was in a survival mode, you know, I was alone. I was going from school to the different places I didn't know. And then I, you know, the revolution happened. They couldn't send them, couldn't send any money. So someone who was kind of like first raised as a princess, I was working three jobs uh, to maintain. I had to like let go of school. I could drop out of the school because I had to work. And then I had to come back and I went full-time school, full-time work. So it was like a survival position. And at that time, it was more like my decision-making were based on survival, things that I had to do in order to move forward. And then when I look at the qualities and the and the way that I also, you know, found my mate, it was out of survival. It's like, okay, you know, these are the things, if somebody just loves me, uh, because obviously I'm a damaged good, that's fine. And, you know, it was a lot of that. And then it was like interesting because the part of my mother who was a high um, achiever was still there because obviously I achieved everything I wanted at 28. But because the under lying reasons, the causality of why I wanted these things were not based on who I was and who I really wanted to be. Um, it was just something that I had picked up from survival and society, or oh, I should be that, or I should be that, or I make sh this much money, yeah. or I should be doing this. So when I got it, it was more like, okay, I know how to get it now, but now I need, this is not it. And then I started looking at who am I and why is it that I don't want this and I want something else? And um, how come I'm you know, always a rebel and not wanting? What is it that I want that I'm not allowed to have by myself or the society that was there that could allow me to see who I am naturally? And that's when I went back to you know, uh, self-growth seminars and all of that um, and, and therapy. And... Um, and then I found my passion, which was being with other people. And then I looked back and I thought, oh, even from, uh, you know, very young, everybody would come to me uh, when they wanted to tell me a secret and they knew it would be there. You know, if there were parties, you know, everything that was there, everybody was dancing, getting high, doing all of that. And I would be sitting with someone talking about their life, like, you know, teenagers love life. We were talking about that and what's going on. And that was the you know main thing that was just juicy for me. And I could be up 24 hours doing this and I would get energized with something else. I would get bored. It was like, I kept getting bored, except with human beings. I can't get bored of human beings. They're amazing. Like every day they come up with something else, which was like, wow, I didn't know a human being could do that or think that way. So that's where it finally dawned on me that this is my passion. This is what I'm natural at. Um, this is what I just learned in one of the books. This is my dharma. This is what I, this is natural for me. And then so... Then I started going back to school and, you know, go back to getting an $8 an hour job and kind of, do, you know, take the steps and the ladder and go back up. Um, so it was this emptiness uh, that was there. And then obviously this, I think everybody can probably relate to this as a human being that we want our parents' um, admiration, approval. And uh, coming to terms with, you know, it's okay not to have it. And it's okay that I am who I am. 
And it's funny because she would be going around everybody, telling everybody that how much she was uh, proud of me. And yet I didn't get that. I got it that I just didn't show up to be the one she wanted. You know, she, she said it had to be. Mm-hmm. So it was always about this thing of, oh, um, I'm never, you know, the conversation of never good enough. So these kind of belief systems that we set up as we're growing up um, out of what happens to us and we own it and we create stories out of it. And then I lived in those stories that were very, very uh, destroying type of, a, you know, self, self-deprecating um, and self-mutilating kind of belief systems and it had to be it took you know it took a while before um working on myself to let go of those belief systems and then learning in the therapy in how to let go and when you dismantle those then what is it that you intend to create and and be and that you have the choices and it doesn't have to be a way that your mother wanted or your father wanted or the society wants it Obviously, you have to live in the society. So, you know, you have to live with the rest of the beings and human beings on the face of the earth. So any type of a belief system that you take on uh, that would promote you and others will obviously work. And if it's if it's a belief system that's just about me and screw you, obviously won't work. Or if it's if it destroys me and you, it doesn't work. So. It's uh, setting that up and knowing which one of the belief systems that I had, it doesn't work for me in a sense. Yeah, yeah. And see, again, I'm noticing that you're telling both sides of the story as well here, you know, saying that, yes, you want to move towards what is truly you, but also you have to live in society. And so you identify, your identity is formed by both those things merging together in, in a union and there's something very exciting about that. And I, I want to dive in a little bit deeper into this um, path of discovering who it is that we truly are. Because this has been something that I've been uh, grappling with for the past two years, I would say. There was a point there where I, uh, you know, I, I kind of heard this advice uh, that made me kind of finally tip in and say, okay, I'm quitting my job as a gym manager. I'm going to be doing my coaching with, you know, my podcast full time and really try to discover something. What I ended up discovering was um, much more of who I really was rather than what I was doing. Um, And, you know, it's funny that you talk about how you were there sitting, talking to people, and that was your thing that you knew it energized you, but other things would bore you. Literally, you know, in the past few podcasts, I've said things like I've noticed that when I do something that I really don't want to do that bores me, it, the results of that are never quite as good as when I do something that I truly love to do, which makes you question, is love really all that we need, right? <laughs> but um, but I guess my question is, I have felt as I've gone on this path myself, just discovering exactly who I am. I felt that once you arrive at that place, you also simultaneously learn that that is always going to be a process, never a destination, right? And so it's always going to be carrying you like the artist's journey. They never know where they're going, but it's carrying them somewhere. But that's bad news for me because I, uh, um, my person, you, you know, as a psychotherapist, my, my personality trait, I think I'm 92 or 93 three percentile trait openness which you know just leads me to having all these things that i love to do i love playing piano i love coaching i love podcasting i love doing this like you're writing all of this so how do you balance the possibilities that come with understanding who you truly are with also solidifying an identity that does work for you and the greater culture because obviously you can't just wander around picking what you want all the time when you've got to somehow fit into the culture that you're in. How do you, how do you solidify something when you're in that stage? Like I am, and I guess I'm asking for psychotherapeutic advice here. (laughs) I don't think that we should actually limit ourselves. I think that it's beautiful to be able to express and, and experience. So experience and express 
different sides of us in different things. So you express your, yourself in a different way when you're playing a music or mm. you're a different way when you're with another person coaching or when you're doing the podcast or anything that is there is part of your expression. Um, I think they're all great. The other part of it is what am I committed to doing right now? Because any type of a um, any any type of success or true experience of getting good at anything and really enjoying it, it's going to take commitment of time and practice and um, you know learning skills in that area. And we have twenty four hours, and hopefully we'll sleep eight of it. So we have sixteen hours that then we have to divide between um, you know family and relationship, or intimate relationship, or hygiene, or sleep, or you know uh, tasks we got to do. What part of it? Which one we're getting the revenue from? Which one is more of a hobby? So I think it's more of trying to bring what we have over there within the structure of the 24-hour time limit that it's kind of stowed upon us as human beings. Mm. You know, we don't have, we have free choices. We don't really have free will. Like, you know, I can't change 24 hours to 25 hours. It is what it is. And I got to work through it. So it's that piece of uh, today, if, for example, at a certain age, I can be committed to building uh, my financial independence. Um, another time, an era of my life, I can, you know, dedicate to creating the best relationship or parent or, you know, bring whatever at that moment there's a priority. I would have to choose among all the things I love which part of things I can, you know, dedicate right now in order to get it to a certain place and then shift the priority now to the next to the next so i can experience it all but i can also be kind of like functional and successful at it all if that makes any sense yeah yeah now that makes perfect sense if, if i'm hearing you correctly it's about recognizing that uh well it's similar to what I, the advice i got from sharon labelle uh who's who talks about how she's interested in the many different languages that we can use to express ourselves this has been something i've been discovering um and, and so what you're essentially saying, if I'm correct, is you can still speak all of those languages, but there might be one or two that is going to be your ultimate focus at this period in your life, which is going to, you know, take you along a journey to expert status, or, you know, you, you really want to go deep into it so that it can uh, form a very important part of your identity that is necessary. Um, and it also sounds similar to me to what Kai Whiting talks about when he uh, when we discuss the principle of the unity of the virtues, um, meaning at any one time, there's going to be a best thing for you to be doing or best thing for you to be working on. And you've got to discern what it is at any specific time. So it, it's, it's certainly good advice. And it's definitely the advice that I uh, needed at this point. Um, and imagine, um, imagine that each phase of life also is about something, you know, yeah. like the there's a phase of life that uh, from kind of like teenagehood to young adulthood that we're exploring intimate relationships and platonic relationships. That's like, you know, the biggest thing at that moment. Uh, and people who don't get to do that, then they kind of don't, you know, they, they don't know what to do with the next phase of life. And when I, when I say this is I work with a lot of physicians who they just went straight studying never even had friends, never had intimate friends or, or um, intimate relationships. They really didn't date it. So they went all the way through medical school and fellowship and took the all of it. Now we're 35. And now they're just beginning to explore all of this. And it's already time for them to choose their, uh, you know, life mate. And they haven't gone through all of that experience. And it's more like, okay, now what? okay, now the first person that I'm going to date, I'm going to marry now, but I don't have any skills. Mm. So you can see that each age and each phase also kind of like opens the door for a particular um, particular experience that it's, it's great for you to be able to take advantage of it at that time and then go to the next phase to the next phase. Um, there's, you know, biological clock of women allows a certain age for parenthood. So how many women that I've worked with right now where they've missed, 
you know, they've gone through a lot of career and they miss the opportunity for parenthood. And then they go through the grief and all of that. So, and I'm not saying one is good or bad. I'm just saying when you prioritize this, you're going to not prioritize something else. And um, so it's important to look at the phase of life also as it naturally brings to us if we want to choose it or not, not deny it, because obviously if you deny it, you're going to miss that those opportunities. Something yeah. that my husband and I before COVID said, um, until we wanted to walk, I'm uh, going to be 60 this year and he's about um, eight years older than me. And are we like, you know, we want to travel the world as long as we can walk. Because that's how you're going to enjoy it, you know. And then obviously the COVID happened. The world yeah. closed. We're still, we're still hoping to be able to do that. And it's like, okay, the rest of it, which is, you know, sitting on a cruise or just whatever, I can do that at 80. But I can't really, you know, I'm sure there are people who are still walking around, you know, but a lot less that I can. So those are also opportunities to look at what is appropriate out there out of all the things that I love to do which is most appropriate for this age and for this phase of life? And can I prioritize my time and commitment so that I can capture all that is for this time and then complete my experience with it and move to the next phase? So that could be also a criteria to kind of like choose. Yeah, yeah. I, I resonate so strongly with what you're saying here, just thinking about life as seasons and, you know, trying to get a better understanding of which season you're in and, um, and don't you feel as though this is also heavily linked with uh, knowing yourself and actually understanding how to listen to yourself, uh, listen to your body, listen to your mind, your soul, whatever it is, and to the clues that it's leaving for you for which season we're in? How, how, how do you think, you know, this, this has been something that I've been trying to say on the podcast for a long time, even to do with uh, virtue and ethics and stuff like that. I feel like we need to learn what virtue feels like before we learn how to kind of rationalize our way through it because often rationality can lead us astray when if you learn what it feels like to be in the right place at the right time with the meaning and the experience of of flow and and all this sort of stuff that's often a better guide and i'm wondering if 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 you feel that that going on that path to truly knowing who you are and what makes you tick is it also a pathway to learning what it feels like to be in a certain season of life. Absolutely. I think what we do with children a lot of times, because we want to guide them all with good intention, because we want to guide them. We don't teach them how to listen to themselves. We don't teach them to be aware of what's going on, what's right and what's wrong for them. Um, our guidance takes them that I've learned these things in my life. So I'm going to give you a cheat sheet. This is the way it needs to be. And uh, you don't get to experience your own. This is the way it needs to be. I don't want you to fail. Just succeed right away the way I've done my failure. I've got the lesson. You can just get the lesson. Well, that's where we confuse people because each person has to find their own lesson. And it's beautiful to have those guides around where they can be there and I can pick and, you know, pick it when that's there. So that training, as you just said, of how do I listen to me and not question myself, not negate myself, but also to know which, you know, out of, again, all the thoughts that are coming, all the emotions that are coming, uh, that they're all valid. There's nothing wrong with it, but each one has a consequence and which one of the consequences I'm choosing, but I should be the one who's choosing. And maybe I have to try it to see what consequences they are. And I usually tell parents, let your children make the mistakes as soon as possible. Because the consequences that we pay as a child, a lot of times is less than when we do it in adulthood. Mm. And many times we can, uh, you know, people give us leeways as a child because we're in a learning phase versus as an adult, when you do those things, they don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, if a child for the first time and many children have experienced this where they're crossing boundary and they really want to know, they go to a store and they see a gum and they're like, oh, I wonder what happens if I just take this, anything happens. You know, they're testing boundaries. Let them make that mistake and then let them learn from it. Come back and say, you know, well, you need to pay for it right now. You can't take these and let them go and tell the other person, I'm sorry, I took this. 
and I need to pay for it. So they experience taking something from someone and what it feels like, like what you just said, what's the experience mm. of stealing and what would it do to another human being? And how is it if I apologize? What does that do? Now, if I allow my children to experience this, it's much better than somebody, you know, stealing at age 40. I don't think that there's going to be a lot of leeway. Uh, you know, the consequences are much harsher in a sense. Yeah. So what you can see is um, that if I, if I have the opportunity to listen, to feel, validate my needs, my desires and all of that, but also to know that whatever I do impacts another human being or many other human beings. And how is what impacts am I choosing? Because I can, anything, it has some sort of a consequence, whether it's a positive or a negative. And that I, and with any of these actions and choices of virtues, I have to face it. I have to face the other side. Um, that might help us experience and then um, choose the virtues in whatever it is that I want to experience and then have an impact. I think people don't re they they all realize how we get impacted by other people's uh, behavior. But we don't necessarily become very aware of how we're constantly impacting others by our own behavior. Yeah. Yeah. This is beautiful. I hope everybody who's listening to this when it's out uh, is catching as much as I'm trying to get here because this is, I feel like this is a personal session just for me. It's great, you know, because I, I, I certainly find that, um, you know, to be open here, I think that one of the things that I often struggle with is, uh, you know, if I have hurt somebody or if I have said something that even though my intentions might not have been too hurt, uh, it still happened my pride will step in immediately and, you know, I will not apologize for this. And, and it, it's, it's certainly something that I've been trying to work on lately is recognizing what it feels like to, d despite the pride, despite not, it not being necessarily a nice experience to have to apologize for something, learning to find pleasure in, in seeing how you, you can respond to somebody differently and they will then in return give you sweetness back when you are able to get to that point where you cross the Rubicon of pride, <laughs> you know, and, and actually just, yes, I was wrong here. And I am sorry for that genuinely. And, you know, I, I also have things to say here, but, you know, ultimately I can see, you know, and it's, it's something that perhaps, you know, perhaps when I was younger, I didn't have that experience as often as I could have of, of actually, apologizing and then having that interaction, right? And there's a power uh, that happens with authenticity and vulnerability mm. that we think it's weak to be authentic and vulnerable. And there's such a power with it. And when you experience the power that comes and you experience the anxiety that shows up with holding up, a uh, holding up an ego or lying, and I'm like, do I want power? Or do I want anxiety? And the power is really um, into that concept of authenticity and vulnerability. When you hold yourself powerful and express who you are, um, it touches another human being. And I'm not saying that it's it's always and other people are not in their own ego or power trips and they're not willing, you know, at times they also want to, you know, cut you down or do whatever. They might like the first story that I said, you know, I was being vulnerable and saying and sharing and, you know, this woman was kind of like just badgering. But I, I held my space of authenticity versus lying to her. And that space of authenticity opened up something which she got in that I am powerfully this person, not that I'm afraid of being that person. No, I'm powerfully, yes, this. And I think there's a shift when we, when we capture that. I remember the first time with the sexual abuse, obviously it was a secret for many years. Then it was a lot of shame for many years. There was a lot of, okay, even if I healed in, in therapy for many years, then it was like, 
remember my mother is a very famous person i can't say that you know it's it will say something about her and how she was not and so i'm not going to say that while she's alive and it was after she had their dementia and she passed away or all of that that it was more like i remember it was a, a it was an iranian women uh, conference and the woman who ran the conference came to me and said fujan um, i we want to do uh, a, a, conver a conversation about taboos and some of the taboos that are there, especially, you know, in our culture, and I think in most culture is are a couple of topics. One is uh, sexual abuse. Um, another one is um, uh, the uh, LGBTQ. Another one is addiction. These are things that are taboo. People don't talk about it. They're hold it back. They're just, it's hard for them to, to share. And do you know of any of your clients or friends and stuff that they will share that? And I said, I will. She goes, what? I said, I will. She goes, and you're, you know, kind of a public person. I said, but it's time. It's time for me to share because I know that it actually helps others. And um, so, but I remember the first time I was going to share, you know, my vulnerability was going to be out there. I was crying, you know, there were hundreds of people listening and being there and they were being videoed and stuff. And it was just this essence of vulnerability of it's okay that this is my experience and I'm going to share it with the world, but I'm going to do it powerfully. But with my vulnerabilities out there now, but powerfully is out there. Mm. And you see that it like, I got a lot of people who came back and said, we've never said this out loud. Thank you for sharing it. I'm going to say, so people started talking and then the same way you saw with the Me Too movement around, for example, that people started talking, just claiming their uh, the, the power of stating that it's okay to have that uh, type of an experience. Um, so if that makes any sense, but when you're talking about yeah. apologizing, I'm saying when you get it, that you apologizing is you just being very powerful and the other person can really like, get it that they can be safe with you mm. because you didn't intend to harm them and even if even if you harm them without that intent that you're safe enough for them to come and say ouch that hurt and that you could say oh i'm sorry i'm sorry that i hurt you and this way of being um connect and create safety and closeness and bond versus, you know, the separation, which, like, like you said, our pride and ego brings. And I think pride and ego have its own place. Like we've got to build yeah. a healthy ego and uh, before we can, you know, kind of like dismantle it. Uh, but it's almost like everything has its own place. And it's almost like a tools where we can know, okay, I, I'm going to take my ego here and use it here. And then I'm going to take my pride and I'm going to bring my vulnerability here. And whichever works at that moment will bring it in. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, back to the the unity of the virtues that Kai talks about, is, which is a stoic principle, is like at any one moment, there's going to be a tool at your disposal that is most necessary, most useful. And I don't, I don't necessarily have, know how this question relates to, um, you know, this finding this vulnerability, I, although I'm sure that there will be links there. But I, I want to dive a little bit back into the identity uh, crisis that so many people face, uh, including myself. You know, and and I feel like is 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 there is it necessary to find a way to grieve the loss of our former self as we move into the realization of who it is that we truly are? Because oftentimes I feel like you know, it's, it's, it's so difficult to leave that part of us behind. I mean, Seneca talks about how uh, when you're truly going on that path of being satisfied with the goods of your soul, you have to stop looking back to keep, to, to see what you can keep with you. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering if grief is a necessary part of that, uh, learning how to leave that behind. Yes. And I think there's a transition and integrative space. What I usually have experienced with my own growth and, and, and others in therapy is that you would go two step forward, one step back, two step forward, one step back. And this one step back is always necessary in order to integrate a lot of the stuff that is coming in. Hmm. Um, 
there's the grief that we're, uh, one thing is uh, there's still attachment to a lot of areas that is almost like as I'm going forward, I want to bring these uh, goodness with me. Um, but also people tend to bring the pain with them because they want to not forget as a, as a learning tool. And it's like, well, can I get the lesson from it and not necessarily bring the pain? Can I heal the pain and bring the lesson? But most people don't know that. They figure if I can just carry the pain with me all the time, it would be a good reminder for me never to do that again or never let anybody else do that again. And it's like, no, no, we could we could, you know, kind of like uh, separate these two and get the lesson and move forward. Um, but there's also, a, I think the grief is appropriate with any phase. Like we become a teenager and we grieve our childhood, which we didn't have to do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you become an adult and you're grieving your teenagehood because you were careless. You didn't have a fear in the world. You couldn't even think about a month from now. Everything was there and extreme and all of that. Then you, you know, you want to get married and you're grieving your singlehood, you know. Uh, then you're having a child and you're grieving your matehood, loverhood, and your kids are growing and moving forward, you know, and then you're grieving them being a kid and really needing you. And now like, you know, uh, they're confronting you and, and questioning your identity. And um, then you get older and, you know, at age 42, my eyesight went from 2020 to, ah, uh, I can't see foggy, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I got to grieve now my body deterioration. Whereas my eyes or ears or, you know, all of that. So I totally agree with you that there's a grief process that is consistently part of the growth that is happening. And, um, and I think it's a necessary part of it. And then I think with that, that grief, we also see what I want to take or not. And kind of like shooting back at the first question you had about immigration, you can see, like, I come from a family culture, and then I come mm -hmm. from a country's culture where I had to pick and choose which part of these I no longer wanted to take with me and which part were a blessing, which part of my mother I would always take and which part of her I would leave, my mm -hmm. father, which part I would take with me and which part I would leave, what part of my culture are just so dear to me that it will always be with me and what part of the culture I would say no. Um, and even coming to the forefront of what I'm coming at, I can still pick and choose, oh, this one I want, I don't. So it's the constant creation of the I uh, based on what I've learned of me to be and what I'm constantly learning to be. And I think that becomes an integrative process. Yeah, yeah. That's such a beautiful way of looking at it is, is that there's always something that we're leaving behind and there's always something that we're moving towards. And um, it just yeah, it just reminds me of something that I heard from uh, Jordan Peterson. He was saying how a lot of psychologists ask these questions like, why do people do cocaine or why do people get depressed but he feels like it's the wrong question the question is why aren't we all constantly doing cocaine and depressed because we're constantly being bombarded with these challenges in life there's so much suffering there's so many things as you say we have to leave behind um and it's it is kind of the wrong question i mean like you know we we there's a whole bunch of reasons why we might just drop out of life but um it's uh, it's it's always obviously important to find that true meaning that is calling us forward. You know, Fujian, I had, you know, like 10, 15 questions listed here. I haven't asked a single one of them, and I think that's a sign of a brilliant conversation so far. I've really enjoyed this, but I do want to dive into your awareness integration therapy because I'm fascinated about that. Now, this is obviously a book as well. I want you to tell me about how it came to be, what was the process, and 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 what's the therapy and I guess I'll let you dive in with whatever you want to tell me about it, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, it it came from um, all the things that I had ever learned. So side by side, thirty days I did thirty years I did psychotherapy, and I did the self growth uh, path, and mm. um, you know the the paths of uh, existential humanistic beliefs, theories, 
uh, then came to a cognitive behavioral that came all to the all the emotional uh, kind of focused uh, therapies, body, um, spiritual, uh, trauma oriented, hypnosis, um, eye movement desensitization for releasing trauma. I kept going and learning. So three path was psychotherapy theories, um, self-developmental theories, and then like spiritual world. So it was like, you know, kind of maneuvering from all of them. In the spiritual world, I think I was working with a group um, at, a, at a hospital for almost three years working with suicidal patients. And when you're we really working with the real suicidal patients, um, you can't you can't just tell them, think positive. It just doesn't work. Uh, many of the theories of psychotherapy just wasn't working. You know, I mean, at one point we did everything for someone. Every one of us signed off. All was well. She walked out of the hospital and she went and killed herself. I mean, we were just like, nothing could hold her back, even though treatment was there. So at that moment, I'm like, okay, there's got to be something beyond these human theories we're talking about. And then I took on a five-year... Um, concept of what's beyond this? What's, you know, what do you think of God? What do you think? What? Do, and I'm not a religious person at all. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not part of any religion. And it was amazing. Just that question. Everybody, by the way, loves to talk about this. So I got bombarded with everything you could ever imagine from you know, the, uh, the religions and then the uh, new age and then uh, the channelings and then, you know, the, the uh, 30 volume of a cold. I mean, anything you could imagine, it was suddenly like here. So I, I, I felt like I was blessed with all of these things that were just coming at me. And then I started taking these pieces and, you know, kind of like practicing them, all of them in, in uh, the psychotherapy sessions. Um, I was known for deep work. And um, even in, in where, I, where I am in L.A., a lot of people who just did cognitive behavioral something, if they just couldn't go deeper, it was like, call Fujian, you know, have them. Mm. Uh, work. So one of the things that I noticed, though, is uh, many of us would keep going to past memories cry a lot, keep going at it and get, uh, uh, you know, a lot of Kleenexes, a lot of this. And as a therapist, you're like, oh my God, you know, I'm doing great work. But Simon, these belief systems didn't dismantle. We kept, kept, kept going to the memories and we had a good cry, but none of them dismantled. And so for me, it was like, there's something in here that needs to be looked upon. If I'm the one who's creating the belief, I should be the one who'll be able to dismantle it because I'm the one who created it. Right. And none of these theories would do that. Like best cognitive behavior will challenge it, but then we would be in it before we could challenge it. But nothing would dismantle it. So it was like, OK, now I'm going to I'm really zooming in this and seeing how I can do this. Um, and then it was more like, OK, how to create, uh, you know, cognitive went through cognition. Emotions went through the door of emotion. Behaviors went through the behavior. So I just figured, okay, let's do it all together, clump them all together. So as we, as I started working with this, all three of these and looking at how to go and integrate the childhood issues and bring them and where is it that you could go to the original memory and kind of own that I made this up. So how can I let it go? How can I let go of my story? The stuff happened, but how can I shift my story out of it? And completely, you know, uh, let that go and be um, responsible, even be responsible for creation of that, you know, mm. not be the victim that it just something happened to me, but be responsible that I said that, you know, I actually said that and it's false and I could say something else and started working with that. And I saw, wow, we're doing a lot of dismantling of the core beliefs. So, um, then it was, okay, well, we need awareness because we're not aware. The same thing I was sharing with you. We live in this victimized position. We live in our assumptions all the time. We live in this bubble and we have no clue in our relatedness. And we all live in relationships. Like even if I take you to an isolated place with no other human being, what do you do? Like you start talking to yourself, right? Then we start talking to this cup. We'll start talking to, you know, we'll relate. We can't just be alone. Um, so we live in relationships and it's like, well, we don't take responsibility for relatedness that we're constantly creating. So I started first with 
I can't do anything for my uh, for my identity and childhood until I'm aware of how much the past is actually happening every day in my life. Mm -hmm. So then it's like creating an, a camera to look at me and to look at the world and look at it, the way that I relate to the world. How do I think, feel and behave? And how does the way I think, feel and behave impact my life and theirs? And then I live in the world of assumption. So I would always think about what is Simon thinking of me? How does he feel about me? How is he acting with me? And we do that all the time, you know, side by side, we're living with that. So then I would, okay, let's look at that. And what is the impact of living in under my assumptions about people constantly? And then everywhere I take myself, I relate to myself. So then I'm going to look at my thoughts uh, uh, and feelings and behaviors toward myself and the impact of how do I deal with myself? So now we got three areas and four questions that opens up looking at positives, negative, and all of that. In this process, you can find a lot of your own dualities, like the same duality I was telling you. If you ask me, what do you think about, you know, before when I, when I was like 20, what do you think about men? I would say such and such. But if you thought about how do you feel? I'm lonely. Nobody's there for me. Right. And then you look at reality and that's not the truth people helped me. I wasn't alone. Yes, my parents weren't here, but I wasn't alone. All these people helped me. So it's like you, you look at these dualities suddenly that you have set up these belief systems, which have nothing to do with the reality of today. And so in this process, you start reintegrating them mm. and letting go of these, you know, kind of like storylines that you've created, which is not true. So the integration begins happening, one on a cognitive level and an awareness level. And then you could have that system all the time. So as I look at you, I can watch my own emotions. If I'm getting activated, my camera's on, how come I'm getting activated? So I can, I can work this really quickly versus leaving, thinking, coming back. Now, if I practice enough, I can be mindful at any moment and then it creates emotional regulation. Mm. It creates emotional IQ for me. You know what I'm saying? Like I can, now I can monitor everything. My thought, my, my uh, uh, feeling and behavior immediately within whatever happens in relatedness, which is useful in relations as we go. When through this process, now we find the negative core beliefs that have been holding us back. They've become part of the identity. You know, they've become, I am not good enough, never capable this, 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 which all of us have probably picked and chose a couple of them. Then we go through a process of integration. And it's almost like this. Like, imagine you have a, you walk into the door of a house, but then suddenly you go up and then the roof comes up. And then you kind of like see from the top what's in this closet and what's in that room and what's going on. So you kind of like look at your past in that way and all of these different parts of you, which kind of stored and left. Um, and then you go, we go back and integrate all of these, like bring, you know, the three-year-old child that you left in this room, bring it back a five-year-old from there, a 12-year-old from there. And you, you know, you have a dialogue and you create this like integration and reminding those parts of you, which couldn't be overwhelmed with life. And they just kind of like made a decision about themselves and, and, and the world and kind of like went into a side, you bring them back and remind them, Hey, we survived. Like, don't worry about it. I've got the skill. We've got the skill. You just didn't know I survived. I'm letting you know from your future to you, we've survived. Don't worry about it. So we go through this kind of a process of integration. So that's why you call the word awareness, integration. First become aware. Then you integrate all the parts that were separated from your wholeness. And as you do, and then the key was what I found out is you got to do this in every area of life, Simon. Why? Imagine I made up that my, my mother didn't, you know, feed me exactly when I wanted her to feed me. And I made up that obviously I'm not good enough. I'm not unlovable. And we, we do that, by the way, as kids. We take anything that's around the world and make it about us. So I made up I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. So I go to school. The first child that takes away the toys 
and says, mine, I'm not giving you this toy. I'm like, see, I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. Then I go, you know, to like a high school and obviously the clicks of the high school, they look at me like, you know, see, I'm unlovable. The first time I go and date and the guy says, you know, well, I'm not interested. See, I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. The first time I go to a job, you know, interview, they don't want me. Or I go in the first three months is my first job. I really don't know what I'm doing. And they're like giving me a bad value. See. So you could see like in every, this thing that started here, it goes into every aspect of life. So what I noticed is people come in with one area of their life that's not working, but the source of this and a lot of it could be like impacting all. So you take this awareness and integration process and you go to every single area of your life, relationship with people, with work, with finances, uh, with siblings, with friends, um, with your children, if you have one, um, with your um, intimate relationship. Uh, with your mother and father, and then yourself, your body, your illnesses, um, earth, universe, um, God, death. We have relationship with all of them. So you kind of take these uh, openings to every single one of your area and you look at it. And when you clean up, when you become aware and you clean up and integrate, then as if... Uh, and metaphorically, so you finish up, you finish up with death, you die, and then you go to God, you really look at your relatedness to God. And then it's as if, okay, if you had a chance to be reborn again, as a, like a metaphorical concept, um, what kind of virtues would you like to live? Now, you know, now, you know, based on the life you've uh, examined so far, these are the things that worked for you. These are the virtues and strengths that you have. These are your vulnerabilities. These are the things that you skills you have. Now you have all these ideas and you know which ones do they don't work for you. Now, if you have an option of choosing who you are and intend to be, what virtues would you like? What kind of a thought process would you like to have? What kind of emotions would you like to kind of like surf in? What kind of behaviors would you like to do and which ones you don't like to do? And what kind of impact would you like to have? And then you take this kind of, you create a mission statement for yourself about who I, who I intend to be. And then you take this who I intend to be and then go into every single area of your life and you create a goal and an action plan in that area of how you, you know, what result you want to have. Like what result you want to have in your marriage, what result you want to have in your relationship with others or finances or whatever it is. And then you start looking at what skills you have, what skills you need to get. And you have a kind of like a rope, like a guiding uh, light where you can always go back. So you say, I want to create a you know, loving relationship with, uh, with my mate. And uh, you start behaving and talking and it's like, whoops, it didn't work out. So you can come back. Okay, did I, you know, did I hold my virtue? Did I say that these things? And, you know, again, we're not, um, we're not computers that you, you know, shift and one day you operate on a new operating system. But because you've cleaned up and because you're creating an intention out of like a blank slate and a, and a space, when you, it's much faster to see where is it that I'm going uh, away from what I said I intended. And it's much easier to come back. And you clean up, you apologize, whatever, and then you come back. Mm -hmm. And um, this path has created a lot more fulfilling. So we did this as a therapy system. And, and um, uh, we did research on it and we found that it uh, minimizes depression about 76% and um, anxiety about 64% and raises self-esteem and self-confidence. Then we went to a, a Cal State Long Beach and in four classes, no therapy, actually this book, Life Reset, um, we gave them the modules uh, that I just I spoke about. Um, every week we gave them a module, they did a journaling, and then they came back. No therapy, no coaching, just on their own, working on their own self-discovery, but through the guidance of these. We still found 64% minimization of depression and 43% minimization of anxiety and raising their self-esteem, which was astonishing because this is a group of, uh, in that age, have the highest amount of depression, you know, the first year to the second year of the college. 
Um, so we've been doing research in uh, different types of universities. I'm glad that I'm uh, having some of the uh, students wanting to do their dissertation. So anybody who's listening into us who's a student or a professor or anyone who wants to do research, clinicians who wants to do research, I'm going to support you because I really want to know research on different demographics and different groups. Mm. Um, and then I wrote this book that you liked about the eye, <laughs> is the Awareness mm. in Nutrition Therapy. This is written for to train therapists and coaches uh, and educators. Um, so I started a certification program uh, that people can come in and, and learn and then get certified um, in, the, in the whole model. We also took it in the educational uh, level, which was interesting. One of my friends who works with, uh, she went around the world and decided that she wanted to work with kids. And so she opened up um, um, a daycare preschool uh, from infant to six-year-olds who come in there. And she had gone through this model with me before and she loved it. And she had, that's how like, she was very depressed almost suicidal. She went through this process and she just found her life. She went uh, for one year, she went to 60 uh, different countries around the mm. world. A, a, a single woman of 40 just went around the world, found this like, this is what I want to do. I want to be with kids and teach kids. So she came back and she we, st we did this model from a proactive, not kind of like a reactive where you go through the past, but how do you how do you teach children now how to be aware of themselves as they're growing up as close as, you know, like infancy moving forward? And six years forward, it's astonishing of two-year-olds having the ability to regulate emotions, uh, know exactly what they want, how to come and communicate it, what to say, how to do, how to go based on what they want. Um, and she's finding that actually the kids who are leaving uh, her space, they're much more readier for school and they're finding higher IQs because when this place is calm, <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of emotional toxicity, it learns better. They're excited about learning. They're mm. excited about connecting. So now we're also looking at taking it into the education uh, schooling system so the kids can actually learn this as they're growing up another book is coming out with intentional parenting teaching parents how to do this with their kids so it's that's why it's it's for the therapists the educators and the coaches so they can kind of like expand it wherever humans are let's say yeah yeah i love it i'm, I'm gonna have to dive a lot deeper into this you know because uh it it's funny it, it it seems it seems like a natural progression for me uh from what i'm currently doing i'll tell because i i'm very in line with this idea that we have to take care of multiple versions of ourselves that exist within you know this body and i even think about you know, one of the most valuable valuable lessons that i learned in the past year was this thing that carl jung talked about this natural stage of maturity where you reincorporate the creative spirit of the child that you had when you were younger but lost in your enculturation right that needs to be re or reincorporated into your your being, and it's funny that you know when I was reading about this uh, this therapy, uh, I, I realized I, okay, I need to study this a lot more because one of the first things that I do with any of my clients is I say, go away and write down your thoughts about exactly who you want to be in your family and relationships, your career, your spirituality, you know, your health and fitness five or six areas of your life. And let's just justify the way that you write about that to me. And then I'll ask questions and we'll see if you really believe what it is that you're writing. But uh, this certainly seems like a, a, a much more um, uh, sophisticated way of diving deeper and deeper and deeper into all those different versions of yourself and look at the two-year-old self and look at the 10-year-old self and what are they missing that they need in order to fully be integrated. Am, am I on the right track with where, where you're going with this? Absolutely. And one of the things that happened, Simon, for me was like, I learned that because I was in the self-development and coaching world also, what I saw is a lot of times when we just went to the future um, and didn't delve into the past, the past kept coming and sabotaging. 
Mm. So no matter, like you could do all the stuff that you wanted to do and take on, and then suddenly you will find out I'm not motivated or somebody would come in and they will even actually get exactly where they needed to get. And then a part of them comes in and sabotages it all. So there's always this question, well, something about the past is still unfinished and it needs to come and, and be handled. So that's part of why it's needed to actually look at that. Another part was though, you know, so I'm, and then I'm looking at the therapist views. Many times they dealt so much with the past that they forgot the present moment or the future. And they just kind of like stayed in the past. So now we have a group that works in the future, but negates the present moment and, and the, the only, only looks at the present moment as, as a tool for the future building. Then we have a group that is constantly just looking at you know, what you thought about your mother and father and what they did to you and how they victimized you. And, we, you know, we we built a whole group that are just got pissed at their parents and we just left them there. They're all now pissed at their parents. Like we left all these children. And then, you know, the kinds of the, the, the inner child movement, which is now we all think like I have a two year old and a five year old and a 10 year old and kind of leave them there. And then the best thing is for people to to just do whatever they want. Like they'll lash out and it's like, well, it's my inner child wants to express. Well, too bad. Like you're 50 year old, like handle, you know, you got to grow up. Like I, I, mm. I don't need to have children in me. I can be a grown up and yet have the awe and the wow that, you know, that essence of wonder when I had was a child. I don't need to be a child to be a wondrous. I can be me at age 60 and just every single morning get up, every day wake up and go, ooh, something else to learn. Wow. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to keep myself childish. I can be yeah. a grown up at this age, talk at this age, act at this age, be emotionally regulated at this age, and still be so free to have that excitement. And then to have the observational methods to consistently observe myself, to see, do I need to change my thought? Do I need to change my emotion? Do I need to change my behavior? Which one of these things is working? Which one isn't working? So at that moment, I can shift immediately. So that is a, because it's a comprehensive one. I call it, um, I call it like an in-depth brief. In depth, but in, in a brief time, you can go through all of these things and find it. Um, and part of, I think that part of what coaching needs, which is also, again, different than therapy. I think with therapy, still there's a training about how to heal the past, which most coaches don't need that. That's not part of what they do, but at least they need to learn how to, how to support the client that when the client is there, how to, how to take care of itself and then come out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the skills that coaches really, really need and can, um, can also go deeper than they're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to be diving deeper um, myself and I, I guess, look, I'm going to be respectful of your time. I just have one more very quick question. Uh, I noticed in the first book that you showed me, I'm sorry, remind me of the life reset. Um, I now you've got the image of the tree there. I'm wondering if there's any link between that and your uh, your theory of awareness integration, because it seems like the awareness integration, in a sense, it's like you're the seed. Now you've got to go back down into your roots. You know, you've got to retrieve what is necessary from there. You've got to go into your future as well, the branches, you know, and you've got to bring that all back into the center that is this moment and you, who you are right now. Is there any like link there between the imagery of the tree? Absolutely. And then also, I think that there's a there's an aspect of the tree that there are areas of our life that we need to constantly, they're going to die. Yeah. We need to let them go. They're behaviors that should be let go because they're no longer appropriate. Mm. And I, I always say this, you know, uh, wearing a diaper was very appropriate at age two. But I needed to learn to hold my muscles after a while. And then fast forward, maybe I'm 90 and I do need to go back and use the diaper again. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's learning when is it that I need to use something. Some of these behaviors that I've taken and I've held and all of that, belief systems and all of that, I just, it might be useful at some age, but I need to learn when to let them go. 
and then yeah. pick the new ones and pick new skills for next phases. And the same skill that worked for me in one area might not work. The same skill that I have, even as a therapist, uh, which I work in my, in, in my work, does not work necessarily in my intimate relationship. I can't be a therapist in my relationship. I say that to attorneys who might be amazing in communication in court. But you can't take the same and bring it into your relationship. So some skill that works some well might not. So it's that piece of, like you said, there's a seed. There's always that part of that is always growing. But like any other thing, <clears throat> there's time for death also. Mm -hmm. And I got to know what parts of me I need to say goodbye and let go and grieve, but then let go. And then leave room for all of these new areas of me. Um, the second one, awareness integration, says clear the past, create a new future, and live a fulfilled life now. And the same way you said it is, when we have these awareness, today, right now, is the only time I can do action. Like, past is gone, I can't act. Future I hasn't been here, I can't act. Today is the only time I'm making appropriate decisions and acting on them, and I'm having an impact. So when you say you're so accurate that you take what was the, from the past, you take what you want intent for the future, but ultimately you live here and your awareness should be here. So there is a little bit of a mindfulness in there, but a lot of times when we've talked about mindfulness is a little bit more passive. It's more like the observation piece. I brought that into it, but this is more than an observation piece. This is making decisions in how to act based on an impact that you actually intend at every moment of your life. Like you're being accountable, responsible, and active at every moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in diving deeper, as I said, you know, and, and, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to, I think this is a good place to end the interview, but, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Fujian, this, this has uh, seriously been such a wonderful conversation and uh, I want to encourage everybody to go and, uh, and grab your books as I will as well. Um, but uh, please just tell everybody who's listening, you know, where can they get your work? Where can they find more about you? Absolutely. You can go to fujan.com, F-O-O-J-A-N.com. Um, you can bo get both of the books on Amazon, wherever you are. Life Reset is written for public, for you. So all the exercises are there. It takes you through. Uh, you could just journal and, uh, you know, have it be. And I love to hear from everyone after you get the book and you did the exercises. Email me, fujanzain at gmail. Let me know how it was. And for all the educators, coaches, and uh, therapists, I love this is my, this is what I want, Simon. This is what I intend. I really intend for 8 billion people on the face of the earth to have access to this method. So coaches, therapists, educators, I, I love to support you in order to learn this and, you know, kind of like have this be wherever you work in however capacity you work. So that's the game to biz, to bring this not only to mainstream, but to have access for um, everyone in the therapy world and the coaching world and the educational world. Yeah. Well, we're going to keep on talking about this. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Fujian. Thank you so much, Simon. This has been really an amazing, I even forgot we've been talking uh, for an hour and a half. So it's been really enjoyable. <laughs> And uh, thank you for uh, sharing with me your thoughts your, and, uh, you know, kind of constantly going deeper and deeper. It's been really a pleasant conversation. Thank you for what you're doing with your podcast and, and uh, uh, bringing amazing conversation to people, which I think we just all need it. Well, of course, yeah. And, and there's going to be more conversations between us. So look forward to that. Same here. <laughs> Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one -on -one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.